Yep, we're going to get started. Um, hopefully you all can um, can see. I will be doing some coding, so I apologize if you are in the middle and can't see. I will try and move out the way so you can see what we're doing. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, I'm Martin Thwaites. Um, I'm VP of Engineering at a company called Mago, um, which is the digital arm for Manchester Airport Group. Um, we do um, a lot of um, high load web systems um, that we do. It's not air traffic control because you know life's too short to write those systems. Um, but we do do things that are fairly high load. So 10,000 requests a second. We're monitoring 125,000 price points at any given point. So there's quite a lot of observability that we need to see in there. For us, um, production is the only place that we can do these things. So um, things like logging and metrics and what we'll come on to with events is really important to us. So we we'll us start by asking a couple of questions um, just to see what level we're at. This is meant as a, an entry level talk for people who've not um, ventured into um, logging and metrics in .NET Core before. So how many people here do centralized logging right now? OK, right? Um, that's good. Um, you're doing the right thing. Um, <laughs> Of those people, how many people have actually looked into those logs and looked at any data that was longer than a month ago? Cool. That's, that's exactly what I was hoping. Um, now, a lot of people believe that logs, they're, they're quite expensive to store, and they, people do tend to keep them for a long period of time. Um, now, a lot of the big providers, they do 15 18 months worth of retention, which is completely ludicrous. Um, so that was um, very telling. And if you are um, storing them for that long in your providers, it's probably worth having a, um, a look at whether that is um, right. I apologize. Those are there in the wrong order. We are going to do logging first. Um, but a bit of things that we're going to do, we're going to look at um, some metrics, what they are, what are metrics, and um, what they're used for. We're also going to look at um, actually building some code inside of a brand new solution um, to actually do it. And we're going to look at some logging. So specifically, we're going to look at for metrics, app metrics. For logging, we're going to look at Serilog. Um, and then eventing and tracing towards the end, um, we're going to look at a company called Honeycomb, which is a commercial solution. It's the only one, the commercial solution that we're looking at. Um, but it, they are a differentiator and do things a little bit differently. Um, so um, what is logging? Um, it is meant to be human readable. That is one of the facets of logging. It, it was always built to be read by a human, not read by um, a computer. It was read, meant to be read by a human. Um, this kind of thing that you see here, person X um, called the function. That, that's very, I, I've seen that all over the place. Not really helpful a lot of the time, but it is what people use. Um, there is structured logging. Um, structured logging as kind of, Somebody is probably going to tell me it's like 20 years old, but it's new to me. Um, so they end up being quite verbose logs, um, which is why they're expensive to store. There's quite a few ways that you can do it. Um, some of these you may be familiar with. Um, obviously, Serilog in the top left there um, is the one that we're going to be looking at. A couple of ways to store it. So Splunk, Logs, IO, Datadog, Stackify, all log aggregation providers that you can use. Um, if you are um, of a certain age, you will um, remember back to Log4Net and um, Nlog. Um, my apologies if you are still using them, um, but they are a little bit outdated in my opinion right now. Um, so what changed in .NET Core? Um, now, way, way, way back, um, when you were creating a solution, you'd do file new project, then you'd probably spend in the region about six weeks deciding which logging framework you're going to use, because it was going to be baked in throughout your entire solution. You had to make that choice up front. With .NET Core, they brought in two new interfaces, um, which is ilog or ilog t. Um, now, it's baked into the framework now. You don't have to make these decisions up front around what logging framework you can do. File new project, let's go. We've got logging in place. We've got console logging there. We can choose what we're going to do with that logging after the fact. So already you've saved six weeks of your project of people arguing, which is great. Um, it is incredibly easy to use. Um, it is dependency injection all throughout your code base, so great. You can just inject it into the top. It is library agnostic. Depending on which library you are using under the hood, it will or will not support um, structured logging. Serilog is a, um, a logging provider that you can plug into um, iLogger. 
it is incredibly easy plumbing to do what you are and um, what you need to do. A few lines of code in your startup um, will get you Serilog. That will just replace your console logging with something that looks vaguely the same, a um, bit of colorization, that kind of stuff. Um, but a couple more lines of code, and you've now got centralized logging. Um, it is that easy to add that in there. And we will um, go through a little bit of code, and I'll show you what we're doing. Now, what I'm going to do, we're going to use Elasticsearch. I'm going to run this up in um, some Docker containers. Um, so hopefully, um, the demos will work, because this is live coding. So um, I have literally just created a solution. It's got a Docker Compose file in there with some Elasticsearch and Kibana, Influx and Grafana. Um, and with any luck, this will just go straight up. Now, what I'm trying to show here is exactly how easy is it to bring up a centralized logging cluster. You can test all this locally. I am running this in interactive mode, just to be clear. Always run it in interactive mode locally, because it makes it look like you're doing lots more work than you are doing. <laughs> um, cool. So just to prove there is no magic at play here, let's not update Visual Studio Code in the middle of a presentation. So literally just created a brand new solution, um, and we'll run that up. Is the size OK, everybody? See it, yeah? Good. Oh, that may be a bit too big. I think that's about the best we're going to get. And. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming a lot of people have seen this before. It's a basic .NET new website. Now, if we switch back, you'll see that you've now got console login in there. It's baked in. That, I've done nothing to get that console login in. So obviously, we don't like the default login. We want to get something as a login framework in there. Um, so first thing we do, add a couple of references in. I'm going to use a copious amounts of snippets here. If anybody believes that that's cheating when doing live code, there's a door over there. Um, so Serilog's in there. Um, we've got um, a couple of packages we've brought in. So the ASP.NET Core plugin, that's going to plug you into the pipeline. It's going to give us some, um, some additional data in there. And we've got the console sync and the Elasticsearch sync. Um, sorry, I am going to have to reformat that, because that will bug me. Um, and if that didn't bug anybody else out here, you're not a real programmer, so. Um, right, so we've now got that in there. Um, now what we need to do, add it into our host file here. And add a reference when it decides it wants to work. Is just now what you should see is the the layout of that has slightly changed. So from a couple lines of code, you can now verify that you've got um, Serilog in place. And you can see that that is slightly different to the login we had before. Um, I'm not saying it deserves a round of applause, but if you um, so. That in itself isn't really amazing. Um, but what we want to do is we want to show um, centralized logging, um, how we can get from nothing into some kind of centralized login. So if we add Elasticsearch in, now remember I've got my Docker containers running. Um, nothing special about them. You saw the Docker Compose file. It is um, whoa, um, just containers. It's not special. I'm sorry if anybody really loves containers, but they're not special. Um, so let's run that back up. Now, 
you don't access Elasticsearch directly. If anybody doesn't know, um, you access Kibana or Kibana, depending on how posh you actually are. <laughs> right. Um, don't need to be aware of this. This is just me showing that it is um, very, very simple to set up. And somebody's probably going to tell me there's a quicker way, but. And there you go. You've got some logging in there. That's as easy as it is to get some centralized logging in place in .NET Core. So what's that? Something like 20 minutes, including talking, and we've got centralized logging. That is not complicated. It is not. There is no magic. Um, so what you've also got in here is it's automatically done structured logging. And it's automatically pulled all these out. Now, because we've added it in this way, what we've now got is all of these fields that are now searchable in our login. So we can now do any kind of filtering. We can probably do some graphing on top of it as well. But I never advise doing graphs on top of logs. Um, that's what metrics and other things are for. But you can. Um, so that is not really impressive, in my opinion. Um, but what we can do is we can now go in and show off some of our login. Helps if you put it in a controller, apparently, in an action, apparently. OK. So pull in our logger. Typing in front of people is really hard. It's like if somebody at one person is watching you, it's really hard. Try multiplying that. Right, so again, we've not done anything really special here. All we've done is injected something in there. Try that again. Right, we've, we've not done anything special, and I would have done all this with a pre built solution, but what I'm trying to prove here is exactly how quickly can you add something into your solution to get some really, really decent login. OK, so we've got an information log there. We've also got a, a critical exception, which I hope doesn't happen later. Um, so let's restart that. And if we jump into here, hit our log function. Now, you notice I've added some querying parameters in the end of that. And um, we'll come to why those are there in a minute. So in our logging now, again, I'm not using console now. I'm just going to use, um, use it through here. We can now search through our logs um, for those. So you can see there we've got um, our Oslo thing in there. And if we now search for the violation. You've now got your exception in there with your stat trace. And again, it's all searchable now. And we've not done anything special. This is the power of what .NET Core has added. Cool. So. I mentioned before structured logging. None of that is doing actual structured logging. What we've done there is we've um, taken stuff that's enriched our logs. We've added um, stuff that's come in by the serialogasp.net package, that kind of stuff. Now, structured logging allows you to be a little bit better with your um, logging. So what we're doing here is we've added in a params object, and we've just taken the query string out of it, and we're going to throw that one in there. Now, you could if you wanted to. Just concatenate that, put some um, commas in between, and you still get the same actual log message out. Um, but where's the fun in that? So what we're doing here, this specific at sign um, inside of there, so looks like string interpolation, but it's not, with the at sign says, do something special with it. So 
So, probably should wait for it to go up. So, query stream parameters in there. I've added conference and location. Now, if we now look through and look for the same thing, what you should see now is the log message. It's done some serialization for us. It's fine, I suppose. But what's really important is it's extracted those as fields as well. So just by saying, I want to throw this object in there, what we've now got is some searchable data inside an Elasticsearch cluster. That is pure open source. There is no cost other than hardware, that kind of stuff around building it. Now you've got the hard problem of running Elasticsearch, which we are not going into because that's a much, much bigger to topic. Um, but that, that's it. That is, that is logging. It's not, it's not hard anymore. There's not what you used to have with things like um, Elk, where you'd have your text-based logs and you would then throw some, um, some parsing in there and try and extract that information, then throw that into Elasticsearch. You've not got any of that anymore. It does it all for you. That's logging. Um, as simple as that. Right. So I'm going to move on. There will be time for questions at the end if anybody has any at all. Um, OK, metrics, different to logs. They are, you can build metrics from logs. I advise never to do that, but you can do it. Metrics are different. They are about numbers. They're all numbers. They are numbers formatted in particular ways, stored in particular ways, but they are all about numbers. They might have tags to give them some description, but they are about numbers. They're time series based. So they are something happened over a particular period of time. They are aggregated for those time periods. And they're optimized for that. That is their purpose. Now, if, you don't, if you've not seen any of these metrics before, probably not in the right room. They're, they're obvious metrics that you would have. But hits per second, transactions per day, the request times that you're sending over to your, your um, payment service provider or your third party who's giving you um, some information, that's, that's what metrics are all about. However, they have some good points and bad points. Whoa. Um, so they're very, very fast to query. Because they're numbers and because they're aggregated, you can query large amounts of data, vast amounts of data for very little resource very, very quickly. They're very, very cheap to store because you can store massive amounts of data in a small amount of space. However, you lose fidelity. So you can't say, for that request on Tuesday at one minute past six by Joe, can, I, can you tell me what happened? Well, no, I can't. I can tell you how many requests were in that period. I can tell you what the average response time was, all of that kind of stuff. But you lose that fidelity to go into individual requests. That's not particularly a bad thing in a lot of circumstances, but it is um, a limitation of them. They're also predefined by the visualizations that you want to do. So you've got to think up front with your metrics. How am I going to be displaying this to my bosses, my, um, my peers? So you've got to think about it up front, which is potentially a problem because you can't go back and add metrics unless you build a time machine. And if you can do that, you're probably in the wrong room again. Um, so a few different technologies. Um, so I think most people have moved away from um, OpenTSDB and Graphite. I think there are still some people using it. But um, most people now stick in one of the top two. Um, Timescale is a new one built on top of Postgres. So if you're already on Postgres, it looks really, really good. I've not done anything with it, but it does look really, really good. So I'd advise you, if you are using Postgres, have a look at it. Um, InfluxDB is probably the market leader. Um, I think most people are using that. There is a commercial offering and a free offering. We're going to be looking at the free offering. Prometheus, however, is the differentiator. So Prometheus is pulling metrics from your system, as opposed to you pushing metrics um, to it. There are ways around that, but generally the way that Prometheus works is it will call your app application and say, can I have your metrics, please? Which is why it's very, very big in the containerized and service discovery world. Now, none of those, well, they do offer graphs, but I wouldn't use them in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. They do offer graphs. Generally, people use Grafana on top of that. Um, you think that using all loader systems together is going to be a problem. It's actually really easy to throw everything together, and we'll, um, you'll see an example of that. Now, what's new in .NET Core? Now, if you think back um, when you were full framework.NET, running on Windows, 
You may be familiar with these things. Um, they were great because you could buy something off the shelf, sign over your firstborn to a third party company, and they would just look at your performance metrics and performance counters and give you some pretty graphs that you can put in front of your management team and, yay, we're doing stuff, we're monitoring it. Um, however, when we went cross-platform, those don't exist anymore, so we don't have those. Um, so now you've got to think about instrumenting your code yourself, um, which is where our metrics comes in. Um, so it, it's a little bit harder um, because you've got to start thinking about yourself and you can't just offload it onto a third party. There are ones that are trying to do a lot in that space and with the advent of something called diagnostic source um, and the activities and all that kind of stuff, it is proving to be a little bit um, easier and I can see it going in that way, but this is something from .NET Core 2, um, which a lot of that was in its infancy when I started doing this. So, um, Again, very easy to um, do things with. Literally pull it in your class, um, define what your counter is, um, and then just increment it. Wrap something in a timer, and job done. Plumbing it into your application, again, really, really easy. A few lines of code at the top, and then tell it to use the all metrics middleware. We'll come to what that is. So I said before that the big tools that you pay a fortune for, um, they provide some nice, pretty graphs. Now, if you add this little bit, little line in here, and you combine that with Grafana Labs, there is a pre-built dashboard that will bring you some pretty graphs back. Now, they don't do anything. You shouldn't actually use them. They've got a pie chart. Pie charts mean nothing. But management like them. So if you want to prove that you are doing something, do that. And then do the real stuff. So again, we're going to go through how quick and easy that is. So I brought up an InfluxDB and a Grafana as part of the cluster that we were talking about before. We're going to use the same solution. and bring it in. So again, snippets. Never do a presentation without the snippets. Um, so app metrics. We're bringing it in. Um, we're bringing in the app metrics. .NET Core is what's going to give us all of these nice, fancy graphs that we don't really need. Um, we've also got this reporting thing. Now, that's using the background service functionality in um, .NET Core to pull and push metrics out um, for us. Um, and we're using the reporter for InfluxDB. There are other reporters you can use. I think you can actually write it to a file if you really want to and then ingest it through Elk if you really hate yourself. Um, okay, so we've done that. And now inside our startup, we will pull in, so we'll get rid of that. And we'll throw in our builder. OK, one really good thing about VS Code, when it crashes, just restart. But you don't have to shut Visual Studio down, then go for a brew and come back and, and do it. OK. Cool, so we've got that in there. Um, and as I said before, we're adding in the, they should really name this app.makeManagementReports. <laughs> Just like that. So, let's run that up. And get rid of that. Now, what I've, I've done is, when we get to the end of this, there is a pre-built solution I've put up on GitHub with the, um, the Docker Compose script, so you are welcome to use it on your own. Um, all you, literally, the only requirement is .NET Core and Docker for Windows. That's literally it. Um, so I'm going to use Grafana. Um, because I've spun this up from scratch, it's going to ask me to reset the password. That's me proving that I have not pre-built any of this. Um, so we're going to add our InfluxDB data source. So Grafana itself doesn't have any data. It is just a graphing solution. It doesn't store anything internally. It doesn't store the aggregates, that kind of stuff. It literally just queries the underlying data sources. So we're going to add InfluxDB. Um, and we're going to add 
influxdb8086. And I was agonizing over the name of this um, metrics database um, all night last night, obviously, um, called my metrics. Now, this is where you can then import a management dashboard. Now, I know that it's called it's 2125 because I've done this a couple of times. So, but there is a website where you can go on to and it will um, show you all this. Now, that's, that's metrics. We've got some metrics in there from a very, very small amount of code that we've just added. We've now got some metrics in there. All you need to find is a way to host InfluxDB and a way to host Grafana. And you've got it. It's there. Um, and there's a few graphs on there. Um, funnily enough, the default doesn't act, the default Grafana instance doesn't have a pie chart in there because they obviously know that pie charts mean nothing. Um, but you've got requests per minute. You've got various different bits and bobs. But like I say, for me, it doesn't really do anything for me. Now, what you can then do is we can start doing our own ones that actually mean something. So inside of our log function again, um, we're going to have to pull in our metrics. I, I love underscore notation, but I can't get VS Code to do it automatically at the moment. Um, so we've, we've brought in our metrics. We now need to add a counter. So the counter is what defines how we're going to push this in, what tags we're going to use, how is it going to bring everything together um, when it logs these out. And do the same with timers, and there's various different functions. All of these tools I'm talking about, I'm really going very superficial over the top of this. They do so much more. And I would advise you to go in and have a look at what other things you can do. OK, so know your own snippets. OK, so we've added in our increment action, which for some reason thinks it's something else. Try that again. What are the metrics? And there we go. That's because I didn't add any count to it. Cool. So we should now have our increment action. Sorry, I need to format that. OK, so we've got our increment action. What we've, a couple of things we've done here. So um, I've said we're going to pull in a tag um, in, the, um, in the query string. Um, and I'm going to add this as tags onto the metric. So this is allowing us to filter that metric. So You'll come to, when we, when we add this to the query in Grafana, exactly what that means and why that's, um, that's quite useful. OK. So let's increment that up a bit. And let's add a tag of NEC Oslo. And 2019. OK, so forget about that dashboard. Um, OK, so that one, that dashboard we pulled in, it's pulled in a load of stuff. It's assumed that you've got metrics called different things. Because it was built by the people at Metrics, 
it is correlated with the two. Because we've added our own ones, we're going to now need to add our own query in there. Add in InfluxDB, because that's our data source. Obviously, Grafana can be querying multiple data sources on the same um, dashboard that you do. And you can see that we've now added our home counter, which is the one that I've just added. And you can see we've got some data. Um, if we squeeze that in in the last five minutes, you can see some data points coming through of the stuff that we've done. Now, I said that we've added some tags. So I can add in here and say, I want this particular um, graph to be only the ones that have been tagged with a particular thing. Or you can say, I want it all. It's as simple as that. Um, you want to add in um, the sum, for instance. And let's filter it for just the 2019 ones. You've got all the things in there. There's loads of options, loads of options on what you're doing. But that's just the counter. There's timers, there's a histogram function in there. You really can go to town with what you're doing. But the key is here, thinking about what you want to log, what are your key metrics, and how are you going to put those in there. Once you've got those lines of code in there, it's easy. You can just hand it over to the rest of the people on the team that are um, doing this, doing their features. Right, you're doing a feature, great. OK, what metrics are you going to add in there? It's literally a case of you going, iMetrics in the controller, iMetrics in any one of your service classes, and away with it. OK. Um, that is metrics. We are running well ahead of time. <laughs> Um, cool, so I'll try and slow down a little bit. So, um, so events are a bit of an intersection between the two. They're, in my opinion, quite new, um, but it's a different way of thinking. So when you think about logs and structured logs, structured logs are probably a lot closer to events and traces and that kind of stuff. But the idea and the movement around um, observability in general and events is around not losing that fidelity. It's about very, very high cardinality. Log every single request. Log every bit of data you possibly can. But don't store it for very long. Now, everybody I would imagine has had some kind of production issue, an issue that only ever happens in production, that you've got to debug. Now, what is the best way to debug an issue? Well, that we've got a debugger. We'll just attach it. Has anybody ever attempted attaching a debugger to a production system? <laughs> Did it go well? <laughs> on, a, on a web system, um, attaching the debugger, stopping all of the threads on the server? Not really what you want to do. So what's the next best thing? Well, I want all of the information that happened, every little bit of it. I want to be able to drill in, find out what the request response time was, what time did this request start, what time did that request start, what, time, what parameters were passed in to each one of the functions down the way. If you've got all of that information for every single request that happened, and you've got a tool that can then bring all of that together and show you it, and allow you to navigate it, that to me is the next best thing to being able to attach a debugger to production. If somebody can create something where I can attach a debugger to production and replay that, I know there is a few that do some similar things, but I've never had success with them. But um, that is what events is trying to solve. It's trying to solve the idea that things only happen in production. Now, I mentioned our use case at the airport where we have 10,000 requests going through a second. A lot of the bugs that we come across only happen at load. They only happen with production data where you have all of those pipelines. You've got administrators accessing the system. You've got users accessing the system all at the same time. So the only place where we can replicate these issues and debug them is in production. So this is where we had to go. Now, the, the, other, po the other problem with this is a similar problem to metrics, which is they're deliberate. You've got to work out what you're going to store. Obviously, the more you store, the more it costs you to store. Or more specifically, the lower retention you can have. And that is the idea around this, is it's increasing your visibility within the system or how observable the system is. But they're built for debugging. But keep them for four days. I always say four days because there's a weekend and 
a lot of us don't work weekends because we're smart people. Um, so you come in on a Monday, you want the last four days worth of logs so you can be able to see these production issues, be able to debug them, drill into what the data was, drill into what was happening at the time, that kind of stuff. But at the, the question at the start was exactly around this. People store their logs, their structured logs, for months and months and months because that's what you used to do. But nobody ever looks at them, so why are we storing them? It's a GDPR nightmare, storing logs for that long. <laughs> so low retention, keep them just for the amount of time that you need it, therefore you get a legitimate exclusion or whatever it's called. There you go. Um, so you keep them for a low retention. Now, there are a couple of tools that are trying to do this. Um, there are some open source tools trying to do tracing, which is slightly slightly different. Um, so you've got things like Jaeger and Zipkin that are doing the tracing type things. Um, the tool I'm going to focus on, which is the tool I like, I know I am wearing their t-shirt, I am not an employee of Honeycomb, just saying. Um, I just think they're awesome, and I think what they're doing is pretty different to everything else that's out there. So they are based around production de debugging. They, their use case is high usage systems. So if you've got something that's getting four or five requests, just do logging. I mean, don't, don't worry. Just, just log some stuff out and keep it for as long as you want. If you're doing something that is incredibly high load, you need something that is built for that use case. And at the scale that some people are at, there's not that many people um, that are out there. But this is an example of what they're doing. So you've got millions, millions of pieces of data going through that platform. You're then, how do you sift through that data? Is it just a graph showing averages? It's not really going to give you that. You want to be able to drill in. You want to be able to see correlations, that kind of stuff. So they are more than just graphs. And things like Zipkin, things like Jaeger, they're more than just graphs. They're built around you being able to debug that production system. Now, the other thing is I built the honeycomb.net library, so slightly biased. Um, but it's very, very easy to use. Um, and I built it based on the ideas of the other two things that we've looked at, the login and the metrics, where bring it in, add some data to it. Now, what you're doing here is an event is created for every single request. Now, you've got one context, which is your request. And the idea of these tools is just add more data to that request. Don't worry about it having four, 500 fields on there. Just add everything. Sample it if you need to, if you're doing way, way too much data. Sample it, but just add everything into it. And again, a couple of things in your config file to do it. So I'll go through a bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, do the same as we've done with the others um, and bring that in. OK. One of the key things of the way that I've built this, and the reason why I didn't come up this with a pre-built solution, is to show you about layering some of these things on there. Because we've got, what, something like 12 references in there now. It's much easier for you to see when we've actually added just little bits on as we've gone. So I've got Honeycomb in there now. And we've got some settings that we put in. And we'll call it NDC. OK. That key will be gone by the end of this presentation, just saying, so don't try it. Um, cool. So we've got them in there. And throw in our. Save that file. There, that's why. So that, and tell it to use Honeycomb. Okay, that is as easy as adding um, Honeycomb is in there. Run that through. 
Now what you find is this is a little bit less impressive than the other ones when you're talking about small data sets because <laughs> um, the graphs don't look half as pretty. However, what I will do um, is they have a, a play site for you to look at of what your data will look like when you add it to a production system and see lots and lots of data in there. So it doesn't look half as impressive as anything that you've seen on there. Um, but the raw data is there. Um, in there, and as you can see, it's just added individual line items, line items in there. That's every single request that's gone through the system. That's the default position for these libraries. It is just log everything. You can sample it if you want to, but keep it for a very short period of time and log everything. Now, if you go through their play site, and this is where this tool comes into its own. I don't know why I was looking at that one. I can do a look at this. Um, so if we start to think about um, a heat map, which is, in my opinion, the best tool that you've got when you're looking at high load systems. So you start to see that. And this is where the really cool part comes in. So you've got a graph. You've got some data in there. Imagine that is millions and millions of requests a second that you've got going through there. You think about metrics, you've lost fidelity. So you can't really drill in and find any more information on there. If you think about logs, I, I, I really wouldn't want to be searching through that many logs. I don't know about you, but um, that is not really the most pleasant experience. But with things like this, what you can actually do is you can zoom into that and have it blow out every single one of those metrics, graph every single one of them, and see if you can pinpoint some of that information. So when you're starting to look at really, really high load systems, you need to be leveling up that monitoring. Logs and metrics, they just aren't good enough. They have use cases that you have to really think about. That's why when people say, oh, well, yeah, we're doing logging, or we're doing metrics, well, great. Are you doing logging and metrics, or are you just doing logs, and then you're building some metrics off the back of it? What are you using them for? Think about them as individual elements that you've really got to think about what their actual use case is. So. My timing is well off. Um, I motored through quite a lot there. Um, so I put up some resources um, on there. Um, they are all available out there for you to, um, to have a play with. Um, and considering we are 20 minutes early finishing, um, I will more than happily take a battering with questions. But if not, thank you very much for coming. Anybody? Oh, yeah, question. Uh, what's the price price options for honeycomb? Um, I think it's about how much you want to store. Um, it's all based on how much, how long you want to store that data. So I think cheapest is something like seventy dollars, um, but it can go up to quite a lot. It depends on how much data you're putting in and how much you want to store, how much you want to sample. So if you only want ten percent of your data, if that's a representative set then you can just take 10% and obviously reduce that retention around. It's up to you about working out how much, how much is valuable to you in terms of how far back you want to go. But it's to encourage you to only think about things about debugging in production. Because you don't debug something that happened three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Something's gone wrong, you're right, I'm on the computer right now doing it. The, the alerts have gone off, my monitoring is the, that's based on metrics has all gone off, right, great. Let's go on there and look at Honeycomb, or let's go on there and look at Jaeger or Zipkin or any of those tools. They're point in time things. It's not about going back three years and working out what happened or a trend of say, well, what happened last year versus this year? What happened last month versus this month? It's about, look, there are some key things here, whether it's response times of a third party or whether it's the, um, the average, average response time of a particular page but I want to know why that happened. And I want to know what the differentiator is between the requests that were long and the requests that were short. Was it someone, one of the third parties that was running slow, which caused the home page to go slow, which we have had on, in our company where somebody's put something in there on every single home page call, calls a third party, and that third party ends up being slow, which means your home page ends up being slow. 
but it's only for part of the request. So you need to know what those differentiators are. But it happens in the moment. I say four days is a, is a really good time period because you've got the weekend and you've got a weekend covered then. And then you flip the switch for the vacation or swap them around. Say again? Like four days normally and then you go to the vacation like, yeah, we... Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you, you do flip the switch on the, the, when you go on vacation, but that's more you flip the internal switch because you don't care anymore. And it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> oh, at the back. Totally separate things if, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the, the, the stuff where you uh, will actually enrich your logs with something like a trace identifier or the um, request identifier in .NET Core, which is a really cool thing that's added by the framework. Those ones are really interesting, especially if you throw them through um, the default error pages where you can actually pull out the request identifier and then you can search through the logs if you're using something centralized logs like um, the Elasticsearch example, then you can search for that request identifier and then see all the logs that were related to it. I'm seeing less and less use cases for that now when you get to high volume systems because it's more for me now around tracing, um, which is the, the sort of next evolution for me. So that's the idea that you've got one request and I'm not talking about distributed tracing because people, every time you mention tracing, think I've got five services across three different systems and I need to correlate a request that goes through this system, this system, this system. That to me is not what tracing is. That's distribute tracing, yep. But tracing to me, you can even trace it through your own application. And you have a common trace identifier that will use a um, request identifier or a trace identifier in .NET, and you can trace that through. You can add individual items to each one of those spans as they're going through. You can see the waterfall charts. There's been quite a few talks um, over the last couple of days on using tracing tools like Zipkin, like um, Jaeger, and Honeycomb do one as well, that do the waterfall graphs that you can then see where the bottlenecks were on an individual request, which um, is immensely useful, something we use a lot of the time um, because it's individual, maybe it's a database lock on a particular function that's happening. So that, I don't know whether that answers your question, but it is, to me, that's more around tracing than it is specifically around logging. Yeah, but still in this case, you would go, let's say, you start with the metrics because you see the yep. like, role, and then you switch to the other system and see, okay, here's the metrics of that period of time, and then like, let's take a look at the logs at the same period of time. Yeah. So metrics are really useful for things like alerting and monitoring. So your big dashboard that you have that is behind all of your developers so that when the management come past, they see pretty graphs and they think, woo, they're doing stuff. Um, that is what you use for alerting. That's what you use to fire off your Victor Ops or your Pager Duty or your Ops Genie. That's th those are what metrics to me are about. Because if something's going wrong, that thing is going to be red. You know, they're, they're, if you've got your, your, your threshold set right, something's going wrong, at least one, two, three of those is going to be going off. Now that isn't going to pinpoint the problem most of the time, but that's your indicator that there is a problem. And it's then, right, let's go to town, let's work out how we're actually going to do something with it now. So that's where things like Honeycomb, that, that's things like Jaeger, when you jump into, um, whether it's your centralized logging solution, that's when you jump into bringing all those together. And for me, that is where tracing comes in, not specifically where logs. Personally, as you can probably tell, I don't use logs that much anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> Another question? So if you're doing things like Elasticsearch and you're logging out to Elasticsearch, you can do your own Elasticsearch cluster and you would be logging into another system inside of your own infrastructure. There's loads of ones that, Elasticsearch isn't the only one. Look down the sinks that are on Serilog. There are, how many? About 70 or 80? Well, over 100 now. <laughs> so there are loads of places where you can log these things. That's just one example because it allows really good searching. I believe there's a tool called SEC out there that does something like this. Um, but, um, but yeah, there is a, um, 
lots of solutions where you put it inside of your own system. But it's all about using purpose-built systems. Now, is a database the right solution? And is your database, where your actual transactions are going through, the right place to fire all these logs through? And then somebody goes, oh, I'm going to do a full text search that's going to search every bit of data. Oh, oh, why can nobody, why can nobody pay for anything? Oh, yeah, because I was just trying to search the logs. Sorry. Um, so using a second system is always what I would recommend. Whether that's a third-party system that you host elsewhere, um, scaling elastic search to multiple nodes, that kind of stuff, that's a skill in itself. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that. I would, for us, we use AWS. We use the AWS Elasticsearch service because it is just fire it up and then points things at it. It is just off the shelf to do it. And it works out off the shelf with Azure ones, um, any Elasticsearch cluster that there is. Elasticsearch is just the easiest one to get up and running, especially in a Docker container like that. But it is purpose built for things like searching those logs and um, doing correlations. And you can pull metrics off the top of it. I do play that down quite a lot, but you can pull some metrics off the top of an Elasticsearch logging cluster um, and use that for graphs and that kind of stuff. Any more questions? Yeah, I, I knew that would come up. Um, I, I have a little bit looked at it. Um, it. It looks really cool. It's quite new. Um, I haven't done much with it, um, in all honesty. If anybody has some really good um, information, I'll, I will be around for the next couple of days. Come and talk to me about it, because I really want to hear what it's, um, what it's good at. Um, if you yeah, I mean, all of that is information that you would put in there. Honeycomb is just the tool to provide um, your querying capabilities. If you were to add in the country code as context to that particular request, absolutely. That would then break that out, as you saw on that um, graph where you can just zoom in. That would break out your country codes and say, well, it used to be this fast for that country code, and now it's not. So it won't off the shelf do that, no. It is something that you've got to add in all of that context yourself. But given, given that I provide the context, context does it uh, help me? Does it alert me? Or no. So you can add triggers. Search for it. What should be the best parameter uh, in my information in my request flow? Yeah. That's, that's why I always I believe this is more akin to a debugging tool than it is anything else. because. When you are debugging something, you're not going through and saying, um, I, can you tell me what was wrong? You're stepping through. You're looking at what the parameters were. You're looking at, well, what's the, how is this different? Is this going through that method rather than this method? You're not, you're not having your Visual Studio debugger go, well, it's your country code. It's your, your country code's wrong. Or this country code's slower. It's you debugging through that code. This is just a way of putting all of that data in an easily queryable format at very, very high loads. I can't stress that enough. For me, um, and I'm sure they will say different at Honeycomb, but for me, it only get, comes into its own when you're talking about high, high load systems. Because that is where you start thinking about only testing in production. Any more? Cool. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the questions as well. <laughs>